rough car park, but it was all right overnight for a stop. Free. So we leave the town of Annick, not having explored it much as we wanted to get to Bamborough to spend a few days as we realise the end of the trip is drawing to a close soon and we need to be in the Edinburgh area in a few days time to see some friends. So we must come back one day to explore it further. And we've said that about so many places that we've seen on this trip. We pull into a lay-by just outside the town to have one last look at the impressive castle as well as to get some shots of some rather cute cattle right by the side of where we were parked that were crying out to be photographed. <coughs> Stu plots a route to the coast as the weather looks like it's going to be good today and a sea view is maybe just what we need. Craster is just 10 miles away and Stu targets a spot for the day and maybe, if we're lucky, the night. That's where we would have been. Would have been ideal, no sign. You have arrived at your destination on the right. So there's just a little stop off here, maybe an overnight. And unfortunately it's literally a place for one, maybe two vans most. Stu turns Harry around to go back and see if he can squeeze in. And there it is. Stu touching his chin like that is a sign of anxiety. So we abandon that place and we move on to the fishing village of Craster. Having parked up, Stu goes for a quick stroll around the pretty village while I just chill out in Harry. The village was famous for its herring curing its kippers are well known throughout the world. They look really engrossed in their sketching and painting. This memorial is to one of the Craster family who owned the local quarry and improved the harbour. He served in the British Army and he died in Tibet in 1904. Yeah. Stu wants me to just sit on the beach and relax. I don't feel like it at first but to be honest we ended up having a really good hour just sitting and watching the world go by. And as always, well, for the majority of the time, Stu knows best. We can see the remains of Dunstanborough Castle on the headland. a couple of dogs playing and then a third one wants to join in <laughs> but much to our amusement he keeps nicking their ball <laughs> So when Stu sees this footage, he's going to think that I filmed it because I want everyone to see there's a man at one with nature and enjoying his surroundings. But I'm not. I'm taking it because I know the minute his feet hit that water, it's going to be freezing cold and he's going to walk away as if he meant to. And I so wanted that dog to cock his leg up on him. Will he survive the first? But I bet he won't survive the second. Keep it cool, Stu. And there he goes. It felt like minus two. <laughs> Freezing. <laughs> it wasn't quite the experience I thought. And it's time to move on towards our final destination of the day at Bambra. And we find a lay-by to stay in for the night and it's time to make tea. So Jane's uh, having 
just a quinoa and corn and I'm going to have a steak so I'm going to cut, uh, cut mine separately that's now got the corn added uh, just added some tomato passata sauce in there just to give it some moisture and we're going to uh, just put these red and white quinoa in for um, just three minutes just to warm through, just layer that on the top. And that's the finished article. Quite nice. Run up some fresh stuff, peppers, courgettes, onion, two types of uh, peppers there. And I've got some mushrooms I'll add in a bit. Very nice. A bit longer in the Ridge Monkey to do than normal, but just about right for me. Okay, so it was a nice little lay-by stop. I'm finding Northumbria quite difficult to find wild parks. They don't seem to lots of ghosts around, especially on the coast. We've had a few bips from locals as they've driven past the lay-by. There's two or three vans in there, or three vans in there last night. It was a nice clean stop. People are respecting it. Uh, we're now going to go to um, Bamburgh Castle. As we enter Bamburgh, the castle dominates the skyline. Good morning. Good morning. You alright? Not too bad at all. No, not too bad. Four quid? Four quid on a card, please. What time's the castle open? Is it open? at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. And that's one of the car parks you can stay overnight for £12. The castle has commanding views out to sea. Precautionary head protection for when you exit the ticket office. Bamburgh Castle has been a part of the Northumberland coastline for over 1,400 years. And it has a variety of history that has been restored thanks to the inventor, industrialist William George Armstrong who bought Bamburgh Castle in 1894. Now if you watched our last episode you may recall we visited the National Trust location at Cragside where he lived and built a legacy for us all. The restoration was completed in 1901 but unfortunately this was a year after his death so he never got to see it finished. The restoration cost a million pounds and it's remained in the family since as a labour of love. Bamburgh's history can be traced back to AD 547 in Anglo-Saxon times as a fortified stockade. In Norman times it started to become an important strategic fortress close to Scotland. In the War of the Roses in 1464 Bamburgh was the home to King Henry VI and the castle came under devastating cannon fire and it was the first castle to be destroyed by gunfire. So that sign on the cannon, cannon is a sign of purchasing them by royal money. As you enter the main building the history of the castle is shown on a large projected film onto the walls. This impressive wooden model was made in 1900 as the castle was being finally restored. I had to sell my possessions, my clothes, my stuff. There's various interactive digital displays that tell you the life of the people connected to the castle. That's once you know how to work them. Now unfortunately at times we were getting a bit lost in the positioning of the numerous artefacts due to the long history of the castle but this was probably due to our lack of research or buying a useful guidebook.
the castle's been really well restored and it's definitely worth a visit. So we just parked up uh, for lunch, managed to find a place right by the sea. I'm not quite sure where we're at, we'll put it on the uh, on the map. Anyway, we're going to have some lunch now, I'm going to make a sandwich, a cup of tea. What do we put in there? Yep. 118 grams. What's the noise factor? That's 400 calories. What's the noise factor? 18 fat. So you've gone into denial. I've gone into lovely eating cake. You're in a big bucket of denial. I'm in a big bucket of loveliness. <laughs> Put me face in it. Well, yeah, because you've got to eat too. <laughs> oh, shame. Oh, look who's just here. Who? Little crow. You make it sound like you knew he him. He just dropped here, look. Dropped? What, as in dead? As in flew down. So this is the problem when only one of you is on a health diet. Well, so oh. Stu's just made himself feel better by eating rye vita and low fat Philly cheese for lunch. That was healthy. Followed by two cakes. <laughs> we check on the tide times and head to Holy Island as we want to cross the causeway and have a drive round. You have arrived at your destination. So Jane's down at the causeway taking uh, a few shots. There's uh, the tide today, there's a little chart that you can get the tides on um, for safe passage across. Uh, absolutely advised not to go outside of those um, for obvious reasons that you'll see. Uh, it's quite fast flowing and deep in places I think when it's covered. So it's um, today it's about 3.55 to 11.35 at night is safe and then I think it's around about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning um, through to 9 o'clock I think. So it sounds like there's about a 4 hour, 5 hour window. I was hoping to actually we could uh, go into part for night, you could camp on there, but um, again, um, looks like Northumbria have clamped down and you can't uh, you can't stay overnight, unfortunately, on the car park, which is a shame. I sort of get it because it's a popular destination, I suppose, this one. Otherwise, it would just be rammed full of uh, motorhomes and caravan uh, camper vans, I guess, so I sort of get that. And there's a game of chicken to be played as to when you think it's okay to go and we decide to be boring but safe and wait a while. It's a very, oh, oh, he's about four, six inches under. He's about 20 minutes early, I'd say, for the recommended time. He's over and through. He's in. You could still see under the vehicle, so it's obviously shallow. There we go. Oh, it's away. There. And eventually we go for it. It's quite a drive across with a few passing places.
we're both fairly tired, so we literally drive up to the outskirts of the village, but we don't get out. And we simply turn round and drive back across the causeway and head back to the same lay-by for the night that we stayed in last night. First stopping at the train crossing, where we always get nervous when going over because we've obviously watched too many disaster movies. So um, we've come back to the same lay-by that we stopped last night. It's on part for night. It's one of few, I'll be honest with you. Uh, but it did work last night, uh, so it's quite clean. I think I'll go and do a bit of a rubbish pickup while the bin's empty. Well, we've come back, as Stu said, to the lay-by. He's just going to go and pick some paper up, and Stu's doing doing his bit for the team. I'm just getting back on my feet, literally. I'm almost filming it, waiting for that bag to fly off. So windy when you think it's summertime, apparently, allegedly. But hopefully tomorrow I'll be back up and running and start taking the mickey as a stew again, which is my favourite hobby. Be a bloody Olympic sport getting in there in this wind. <laughs> oh, the wind is horrendous, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Stu's just put that bag in. He's found a coat hanger, and all of a sudden that bag comes flying out. If you've enjoyed this video, then please subscribe, and we'll see you in the next episode. Silent.